so the screen is visible i think no without anything blocked yes prarsh everything okay. is clear so good evening everyone my name is dr prarsh i am a consultant uh, replacement surgeon at uh, sunshine and today i will be covering uh, important topic that is uh, management of intraoperative complications during total knee arthroplasty so it's one of the most common all of you are also seeking to start doing the surgeries on your regular basis they are being performed in bigger and smaller centers everywhere and so despite advances in the way instrumentation has been there to protect uh, certain structures during surgery and with surgical techniques there is still a risk for complication and these complications can occur irrespective of the experience level it can occur when you are starting out in your career and it can occur later when you Uh, perform even more uh, challenging cases, especially with severe deformities. And these complications of TKA can be intraoperative; they can be in the immediate post-op period or late complications. So we are not going to look at the uh, later complications such as instability secondary to you know loosening or uh, instability uh, because of some trauma later. We'll be looking at some of the common complications that occur only during surgery, which will be evident either during surgery or immediately after surgery. so some of the common intraoperative complications that we'll cover today will be with regards to medial collateral ligament injury which may be soft tissue or bony injury vascular injuries such as popliteal artery or other geniculate vasculature nervous injuries which are like common peroneal nerve injury which is the commonest type intraoperative periprosthetic fractures and finally extension mechanism injuries mainly dealing with patellar tendon avulsion so let's get right into it with medial collateral ligament injury and its management so the incidence of mcl injury ranges from uh 0.8 to 2.7% based on the literature and sometimes even preoperatively the mcl may be attenuated or injured even prior to surgery either in a post traumatic situation or in valgus knees etc so it's very important for you to document the preoperative knee stability before surgery so that you can avoid medical legal issues in case you land up with some unexpected instability during surgery and these injuries are very debilitating for patients so prevention is better than cure so when do these mcl avulsion injuries happen they usually happen in these difficult cases during exposure or when you're done with your uh, balancing or trying to balance and during your implantation you are trialing you land up with this injury so tightness of the superficial mcl really predisposes to this injury so how do we decrease this tension over the superficial mcl especially as you subluxate the tibia when you are trying to expose the joint so you have to do a very gradual subluxation with progressive medial release under vision remove any accessible medial osteophytes anterior to posterior as you keep dislocating the tibia so don't try to do a forcible maneuver like we discussed with the ransal maneuver in the uh, surgical technique it has to be a very gradual and a very slow dislocation process and before to do this always remove all the medial osteophytes on the femoral side also especially under the mcl which will decrease the amount of tending look for any big posterior osteophytes even on your x ray so even before you start with the procedure you should know some of these osteophytes can be removed with an osteotome this is i'll show you a picture uh, for the same thing so the mid substance injuries are the most common injuries accounting for almost 75% and the superficial mcl can be damaged by the saw during tibial or posteromedial femoral resection or even during medial meniscus removal when you do it with a knife or a cautery avulsion injuries usually occur if you suddenly hyperflex the knee when it has tightness or in those cases where there is persistent medial tightness as you extend the knee and as you are checking balancing always avoid vigorous valgus varus stress testing on the femur especially in these smaller patients with small bones and poor bone quality it can break so the risk factors as per literature include obesity larger saw blades female gender and high degrees of deformity so you can see how you can see this impinging osteophyte on the lateral view of your uh, patient where you can see how that posterior osteophyte on the tibia really curves upwards and that will prevent you from dislocating even if you take out the anterior osteophytes and try to dislocate so in such cases but as it is shown in the figure try not to use a straight osteotome you can use a curved osteotome you can go under the femur and you can blindly try to hit these osteophytes but obviously you have to take care not to go too posterior in the joint so coming to the etiology of an iatrogenic mcl injury it could be an femoral avulsion it's very common even if you have a decently balanced knee also it happens in those patients with very osteopenic bone mid substance tears happen as i said with transaction with saw during a tibial cut or posterior femoral condyle uh, cut when you try to put your homans around the femur to protect from a medial cut also if you do not take care it can cause a 
superior still elevation of the tibial uh, insertion, both on the femoral and tibial side. Tibial avulsions are relatively rare. And this usually happens during soft tissue release when you keep going further down from the joint line and it, it risks uh, detaching it from its insertion, right? And so this can occur during various stages. So you have to pay attention to the medial side throughout. So what do you find intraoperatively? You find a sudden unexpected medial laxity, sudden excessive exposure where you suddenly realize, oh, it was tight a second back and now it is suddenly very loose and the tibia is moving forward. And sometimes you can actually hear this popping or a wrenching sort of a sound where you have sudden increase in laxity at 30 degrees of flexion and 90 degrees where you have a lot of anteroposterior play. Now, this video just shows you how it looks. It will just simply open up like that. And this usually you can see in this case, it happened after everything is done. And you can see how it is suddenly opening up. And when you put pressure, it just collapses back. So this definitely means there is a soft tissue injury of the MCL when you don't have a clear cut avulsion fracture causing this. So in most cases, you should try to, uh, you know, upsize your polyethylene insert and you can perform a direct repair with sutures. Although according to literature, it doesn't have the best outcome. If you have a complete tear and it is very obvious like this is a case where you can see a gapping, it is always ideal to go for a higher constraint implant like a hinged knee. Or if there is a, a moderate opening, like a grade two opening, it is always better to go with a valgus varus constraint or a CCK implant as discussed in previous talks along with a higher insert. But where you don't have the ability uh, or availability of this equipment, you can go for a direct suture where you have to identify the stumps, the proximal and distal stumps or the soft tissue attachment of the superficial MCL. You should run the suture through it multiple times as shown in the on the left side and you should pull it together after you have put your e components inside so that you can adequately tension it. So don't cement your components until you have the sutures in place, but don't tighten it. You finish your cementing, come back in, and then you do it with a trial insert. See how much uh, stability you are getting after you tighten these sutures, and then you can decide on your final poly size. So if you go through the algorithm for intraoperative MCL injury, if you have a mid-substance tear, you can do a primary repair, as we said, with or without augmentation. So augmentation essentially means that you are using some other additional thing to support it. And this typically, if you look at or if you talk to arthroscopy surgeons, this refers to internal bracing, where you can put a suture anchor at the epicondyle level and distally at the tibial attachments and pass fiber wire. It is actually a very good technique, though we have also not used it routinely in MCL injuries. It is something that is worth considering, which can give you stability both in flexion and extension. The other, is, other thing which you can do if you have the expertise to do it in your institute is to go for an MCL reconstruction, but it is relatively rare and usually you don't land up in such severe scenarios. Or you directly ignore repair and then you can just go for a constraint processes that is either a varus, varus valgus constraint like a CCK knee, or you can go for a hinge as required and depending on the age of the patient, etc. If you have an avulsion fracture, which is very common on the femur side and not on the tibia side, you can go for a screw fixation or you can go for a suture anchor repair because it's a clear cut bony injury in front of you. Make sure you try to use a screw with a washer so that you do not damage the fragment of bone to which the ligament is attached. So primary repair, when you do it, you can do it with bracing or casting after the surgery is done. You can do primary repair with a larger insert or as discussed with augmentation. But the results and outcomes of primary repair are unreliable because usually these patients, you restrict their range of movement after surgery because you have done only suture repair and they land up with an increased amount of stiffness post-operatively. The revision rates are higher with primary repair as compared to going for a more constrained processes. So usually try to restrict primary repair to grade one or grade two laxity where you can just get a uh, part of your stability with an increased poly thickness. Please watch these patients on follow-up if they complain of any instability or you find this uh, instability on your clinical examination, consider revising it if the patient is uh, having a functional deficit. Constraint versus non-constraint. Constraint designs obviously have a better clinical outcome because the knee is much better and functionally it will be supporting them through the range of movement. And there is no particular clinical difference in clinical outcome when you compare hinge versus a CCK sort of a knee. So finally, there is no gold standard treatment. It depends a lot on the surgeon expertise, on what expertise you have in your center as far as arthroscopic techniques are also concerned. Availability of implants uh, like the hinge and CCK need to uh, deal with these problems. Okay. So the issues with each one, primary repair, you may obviously need to use a thicker poly. 
you do not restore the ideal ligament tension. They have lower functional rate, higher revision rates and stiffness because of immobilization. If you have a constrained knee, what are the issues? You obviously are decreasing processes life. So it's not ideal in younger patients. It can cause loosening over a period of time, increased wear, and you're obviously going to sacrifice more bone stock for these implants. And if you do MCL reconstruction without a constraint processes, it's an increased operative time. It's a technically demanding procedure. And we really don't have long-term data available on the outcomes. So this is just another illustration where if you have a sizable bony fragment, you can always reduce the knee. You can do a repair and you can even use a, a small plate on the medial side to stabilize larger fragments. And you don't need to do it only with a screw. So that's about MCL injuries. So coming to something which is very rare, hopefully very rare, but extremely debilitating, extremely problematic, both from a medical legal perspective and for the patient, because these things can land up even in amputations. Uh, and this is regarding the vascular injuries. So vascular injuries, especially arterial injuries during total knee arthroplasty are rare, but there are devastating complications and they're not unheard of. Unfortunately, even over the last uh, five years where we've done over, you know, 7,000 procedures, we would have probably had one or two injuries of the vascular vasculature, which required some uh, intervention. So there is an increased injury, uh, injury potential and the uh, percentage chance is very less. Now you have to understand that vascular complications can be two types. It can be a direct injury where you have a transaction of the artery right in front of you, probably because of some sharp instrumentation such as your saw, and then you have instantaneous bleeding and you know you obviously know that there is a vascular injury in front of you. Sometimes you can have during your implantation process or when you're using osteophytes for posterior capsule, when you place your homan, you can injure the artery indirectly where there is some thrombosis formation or an aneurysm formation, which you recognize only in the post-operative period when you check for the pulses and you have a vascular deficit. So the management of these two and recognition of these two problems is very important. So how do these arterial injuries occur? So usually four principal mechanisms are there. The first one, a lot of our patients are old and they have pre-existing vascular disease. You have etheromatous plaque. And sometimes even in your lateral view x-rays, you can see the calcified artery running behind the uh, uh, running behind the femur and the tibia. And in such cases, it's always wise to get a preoperative Doppler to know where the disease is. Is it a diffuse disease or are there local issues or longer local thrombi before surgery? Because it all has very important implications on whether you use a tourniquet or not. How much pressure do you inflate it to? How do you avoid these issues with compression dressings in the post-operative period? And suddenly, if this atheromatous plaque ruptures, either because of mechanical pressure of putting a Hohmann retractor in the back of the joint, or it can cause an embolus and arterial insufficiency. And this usually occurs secondary to tonica use in a pre-existing illness. The second one is thrombosis of popliteal artery due to direct impact, as we said, and there is an intimal disruption of the artery. Release and correction of severe flexion deformities resulting in a stretch and popliteal artery injuries, direct puncture or laceration transection of other vessels around the joint, such as perigeniculate vasculature. This usually happens on the lateral side where we encounter a larger number of bleeders and which could be both venous or arterial. So it is at the greatest risk direct injury because of its location. It's lying right behind the joint you're trying to replace and rare direct injury due to excessive posterior excursion of the saw blade. So you can see this diagram very clearly shows you your typical location, how your femur and tibia are looking when you're going to take a tibial cut. So you can see on the left side, you can see how the popliteal artery is. Definitely it falls away from the knee when you're going to do it, but it is sitting right behind that capsule, which is visible for you on your flexion gap. On the right side, you can see how the saw blade is. So if your saw blade moves or skives beyond this point on the posterior bit of your tibia, it can go right beyond the femur and it, the next structure that it's going to hit beyond the capsule is going to be your popliteal artery. And the popliteal artery, in general, if you look at the axial section of a you know, cadaver or, or an MRI or anything, it is slightly more on the lateral side than it is on the medial side. So it's a very common question they ask residents in the US. Try to place your Hohmann retractor for the tibia slightly more on the medial side as compared to the lateral side because if it slips posterior and you put a bulk of that Hohmann retractor behind, you are in big trouble. And you can see, you can see in this case, this is actually a wrong positioning. You can see there is in, there is in fact some soft tissue between the tibia and the Hohmann retractor. And you can see how much of the Hohmann retractor has gone behind. And in this case, in this published article, there was a popliteal artery injury. Do not put your Hohmann retractor so posteriorly and do not put it so deep. 
only the curved tip of your retractor has to go right behind the bone. You have to feel the bone and just go behind it and do not further venture uh, posteriorly. Right. So this is just a general preoperative evaluation, which you don't need to really go into because it's a, a more of a vascular surgery related thing. But again, this is a published algorithm. Whenever you are looking at a knee radiograph and you see vascular calcification visible, please do a vascular surgeon consult. They will use things like the ankle brachial uh, uh, pressure ind indices to determine whether further investigations such as a CT angiogram or something are required to find out if it is there. So in this situation, when there is a thrombus or there is a pre-existing thing, the vascular surgeon can always decide whether they want to do a preoperative procedure or put them on medication that improves the blood flow. Like they could do even a preoperative thrombectomy or a preoperative bypass procedure in severe vascular diseases. This is very common in your male patients who have uh, you know, a diffuse disease because of smoking. So like we said, you can have some anatomical uh, vasculature uh, adherent over there, especially in scar tissue revision procedures tethered popliteal vessels because of prior trauma, like in post-traumatic arthritis, anatomical variants or severe uh, flexion contractures where the artery is very close to the bone. So what do you do if you face this situation intraoperatively where you have a direct injury? First, stay calm. It's not costing the life of the patient immediately. Call for help. Try to get a vascular surgeon available immediately. And first, do not try to blindly grasp the bleeding edge of any vessel. Do not blindly put a coker. Do not blindly put uh, an artery forceps behind and try to hold it. It's not going to help. And it will, in fact, cause the artery to retract further. So give firm pressure over the bleeding site. Ensure that the tourniquet is still inflated to minimize the blood loss. Whenever you're doing the surgery, if you start with the tourniquet, always, obviously, it will tell you how much time you've used. But if you're suddenly inflating the tourniquet for this, Mark the time so that we know how much of ischemia time we are losing. The anesthesia team should always have proper IV access with the adequate bore. Immediately let them know that there is a potential vascular injury so that they can change the gauge of their IV cannula so that they can do the blood transfusions because this point is the life-saving thing. It's not about only the loss that is happening. And always try to have vascular repair related equipment in your OT pharmacy at least in such rare cases where people, if you get a surgeon to do this, you will have the equipment ready. So just a case scenario, you can have an intraoperative laceration, acute hemorrhage, you have to uh, infrared uh, and when you deflate the tourniquet, accessible injury, you can clamp emergency vascular surgery, you can either do an end-to-end -end repair or an anastomosis, they usually prefer to do a reversed uh, vein graft or you can do a uh, patch angioplasty, but these are all again vascular surgeon related things. Sometimes if you really have to do it and you know you're in a periphery, the surgical approach is always through a separate incision on the medial side as it's shown on the uh, uh, figure on the left. You have to place a retractor under the vastus medialis over the anterior aspect of your femur so that you can see in the next uh, picture where the femur, this is like your later, uh, lateral plating or a medial plating that you do. This is the exposure that you would aim for. So on the medial side, you will immediately identify the, uh, the proximal stump of the popliteal artery. And if you can, you immediately loop it or you use bulldog clamps and control the bleeding. And this is through a separate medial incision. So other case scenarios where you can uh, suspect a vascular injury, especially in the post-operative period where it's pale, cool extremity, diminished pulses, et cetera, you have to do an urgent bedside color Doppler evaluation. You have to look for any injuries or a thrombus or an expanding hematoma. You do a peripheral angiogram in cases to be very sure because Doppler is very uh, operator uh, dependent thing. It based on the radiologist experience also. And then you can plan for a thrombectomy or a thrombolysis with or without a vascular surgery thing. So in our situation, we can just show you an example, a 67 year old gentleman presented with grade four arthritis. He had a lot of restriction of range of movement in the preoperative period. Val Vargas, uh, he had a va bilateral varus knee. So the TKR performed, the tunica time was absolutely fine. 44 minutes, 300 milligrams of pressure. Immediately in the post-surgery, distal pulses were palpable. Now we started him on Clexane, so POD1, everything is fine. And then suddenly towards the end of POD1, we started noticing difficulty with dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So he was having an ischemic in incident. So a lot of pallor, decreased capillary refill and cool periphery. And then we found that the femoral pulsations were present, but the dorsalis pedis was absent, which means that you obviously have a popliteal injury. So when we did a CT angiogram, we found that correctly you have an acute thrombosis at the popliteal artery and there is no hematoma around it. So that means you don't have an intraoperative laceration or there is no bleeding or expanding hematoma because of your blood thinners and there is no flow in both the ATA and PTA vessels. 
So we immediately did a Doppler, confirmed the absence of the flow, CT angio was done. This acute thrombus was simply removed as a percutaneous procedure and thrombectomy was done with a balloon angioplasty. And then immediately you have very good flow distal to the side. So it's very important. The reason we are showing is the patient is fine immediately on the table also. Shifted to the ICU, everything is fine. And suddenly on day one, you can land up with these issues. So make sure you recognize them quickly so that you can deal with them quickly. Now coming to a peroneal nerve palsy and foot drop after primary total knee arthroplasty. Although you will recognize this only in the immediate post-operative period, it is essentially a complication because of whatever is happening intraoperatively. So where do we deal with these common peroneal nerve palsies? Again, it has an uh, incidence of around 1% to 2% based on literature. Uh, some uh, larger studies have shown 1.3%. The main risk factors are preoperative valgus deformities and even in the cases where you have fixed flexion deformities. Because when you correct a valgus deformity, you are releasing contracted lateral tissues which include the nerve and the soft tissues around it. And the same applies with the fixed flexion deformity. As you keep stretching it out, both medial and lateral structures get stretched out. And this causes a stretch injury or a neuropraxia of the common perioleal nerve. Sometimes you can even have a direct pressure of the fibula, head and neck, and this happens a lot in obese patients with the positioning and placement of any of the bolsters during surgery. And even after surgery, when the patient, if the patient lies towards that side, it is not unheard of. Rheumatoid arthritis itself is a risk factor for an increased uh, percentage chance of developing a common peroneal nerve palsy, and it is because of the increased amount of inflammation in that area. And routinely, that rheumatoid arthritis patients present to you with valgus deformities. Constrictive dressings placed after the surgery, a big problem. And an expanding hematoma with your blood thinners post-operatively if, if you have to instrument it that area for soft tissue releases. Usually, common peroneal nerves, when you have to look at their prognosis and discuss it with your patients, it's a neuropraxia. So complete recovery usually occurs within three months. In our experience also, we have seen in these gross valgus deformities, majority of the times the recovery happens within three to four weeks after surgery. So you have to be uh, in a position to reassure the patient and take the measures to reduce the swelling around the nerve and to facilitate good recovery. So usually this patient patients complain of persistent neurogenic pain, a lot of burning sensation, paresthesias, which occur in most cases. And passive range of movement of the foot and ankle is very important during recovery. And you have to give them a... Uh, uh, ankle foot uh, orthosis to ensure that they do not develop any equinus deformities during this recovery period. So it's very important to understand again, like with the popliteal artery, where is the peroneal nerve? Now, this is one of our own papers from Sunshine Hospital, where we look at the position of the peroneal nerve to the posterior lateral corner of the knee so that you know uh, you know how how much how far it is from your knee, especially during flexion. And this was an MRI based study. So the danger zone has been defined. So it is between the lateral edge of your popliteus tendon. So this is something that you can visualize in your flexion gap after you are doing your cuts. So the lateral edge of the popliteus tendon, the tibial cut surface, and the posterior fibers of the iliotibial band. All of these structures are palpable, and that is your danger zone. And you do not want to go into that zone. When do you go into this zone? One which is very commonly done is when you do your infiltration with your cocktail. So please don't take your needle and go that far posterior lateral. It is not worth it. Stick onto the medial side when you are dealing with the posterior infiltration and infiltrate the other safe areas of the joint. Do not go into the posterior lateral corner of the knee with your needle. Second, sometimes in very gross valgus deformities, you may want to do even a popliteus release or you will do a posterior capsular release with a cautery from the uh, uh, lateral side, like it's described with Ranavat, right? From your PCL going all the way across the posterior capsule. That is another place where you, if you go inadvertent, inadvertently deeper on the posterior lateral part, you can cause an issue. So obviously we're not going to measure it in degrees in all these patients. So that is why you're, so most cases you can see in our study, we found that the common peroneal is lying right behind the popliteus on the tibial side. So you have to be careful in that area. This is just to show you that picture. So that is the uh, zone. If you can imagine when you're doing your uh, bone resection or your cocktail infiltration, et cetera. So how do you manage these cases? You recognized it immediately after surgery. They don't walk well. They have a high stepping gait. They complain of a lot of paresthesias and you can't. So make sure, first of all, that again, you go to your SICU morning or in the evening after surgery, whoever is on call, you have to check for movements and pulses in every single case on day zero, day one, day two, because it's an evolving situation. Remove all the constrictive distinctions. 
put a limb elevation, discontinue epidural analgesia because epidural analgesia can itself result in some amount of a foot drop in some rare cases when its effect is very heavy. So you need to rule that out first so that you know whether you're dealing with a nerve injury. So now you know epidural is out, everything is out. Do you have an established peroneal nerve with foot drop? So you give them an AFO, passive ROM exercises, give them a neurotropic drug like pregabalin or gabapentin and uh, a lot of surgeons nowadays, they prefer to even use steroids, oral steroids. We don't generally use them. Uh, sciatic neopalsy after total hip also, it, it, sometimes it is indicated. And usually they recover after that within one to three months. If usually, again, it's an institutional protocol. If you do not have recovery at one month or three months, then you need to get your nerve conduction studies and EMGs done. And then you can consider exploration of the nerve to do either a decompression or neurolysis, depending on your uh, findings and for this MRI has been described in total hip, but it's not described for the total knee. So the ideal limb position, please understand it is not simply, you know, putting a couple of pillows under the ankle and lifting the leg up into the air. You have to flex the hip to 20 degrees and the knee flex to 30 to 45 degrees. And this is the position that relieves the stretch on the common peroneal nerve. So these are the measures you need to take immediately after. Now intraoperative periprosthetic fractures. It's it's not something that you really need to uh, discuss very much in detail because it's more of a trauma approach. All of you know that it's essentially going to involve, you know, plating of your uh, femur and tibia. But again, sometimes you have to have the uh, thing to recognize them intraoperatively. So postoperatively, we're not really worried. Intraoperatively, you can have femoral, tibial and patellar fractures. Again, you have to look at the risk factors, advanced age, osteoporosis or osteopenia, inflammatory arthropathy, leading cause of most complications in total knee arthroplasty, chronic corticosteroid use, prior knee surgeries, and stress risers from previous trauma. This is where it's very important. So a lot of times you're going to get your patients who come with, you know, previous history of trauma or something, and you have a femur plate or a tibia plate to remove. The moment you take out all these plates and the screws, each of those places, even if it was a united fracture for two years, three years, whatever, it doesn't matter. Those are all stress risers. And with manual instrumentation, with all the pins going across the femur and across the proximal tibia to position your jigs or your uh, preparation guides, these can cross these screw tracks and it can cause fractures. So whenever you're doing surgery where you're taking out some implants, please ensure that you take the precaution to do it in a very focused and a slow manner and do not use excessive force because it can immediately fracture the bone. So it can action, it can occur potentially at any stage, but when can it happen? Exposure, relatively uncommon, probably something like what we've discussed where you can have like a uh, medial avulsion fracture of the epicondyle, but again, that doesn't purely fall under intraoperative fractures. The most common time is when you're doing femur femoral or tibial preparation. So don't take your heavy 750 gram mallet and just keep whacking at the implants, especially when you're hitting your tibia down. Use gentle force when it is completely opposed to the surface of the bone. You can slightly increase the frequency or force of your thing. When the implant is not fully seated, do not hit with excessive force. And when you do box preparation for posterior stabilized implants, the apex of the box is very, very close to the metaphyseal flare of the bone on the femur side. So you have to be very careful. Patellar fractures can occur when you're doing patellar, uh, you know, resurfacing or replacement, especially, or you're trying to just debulk it with the saw. If your saw goes down into the patella, it can cause a fracture. You can happen during your uh, trialing or seating of the polyethylene insert, but relatively rare is usually during your femoral tibial preparation. So I think classification system is known to everybody. It's still based on the uh, Lewis Rorbeck or Sue classification. And you can see how the fracture can happen during the uh, uh, different steps of the TKR. So even when you're doing this, if you have, if your processes is stable and you know that your implant is not getting affected when you have, when you have an intraoperative fracture, you still deal with it like you would with a postoperative fracture. So you reduce the fracture and you can go for a plating, right? And usually you will land up with a plate in all these scenarios. You're not going to do a nailing in an intraoperative scenario like you would probably do in a CR design later. Always try to go for plating. If it's a commutated fracture for whatever reason, or it's a high risk case, like an obese case, on the table itself, you decide to do a dual plating if it is required because you can't come back repeatedly to sort out a implant failure, right? And then if it is, uh, if your fracture is, you know, intracondylar and it is extending in and there is some comminution where your implant is seated and you are now having doubts about your instant implant stability, then you may actually even in the primary instant have to look for, uh, uh, you know, something like a mega process, but very rare. 
but it's something that you should keep it in mind. It, a lot of it depends on the fracture pattern and location. Tibia is again very common, especially in gross deformities and patients who have metafacial varus. So in this also, the ideal way to treat it would be to use a longer stem on the tibia to bypass the fracture site because usually the fracture site is very close to the tibial component. So use a stem which bypasses the fracture site. Please try not to use only a stem, although you may feel that it's a thick stem, it's giving me rotational stability, everything looks fine on table, and it is a very different dynamic situation when the patient starts putting weight on this. So when the patient starts putting weight on it, it can fail. So apart from a stem extension, you have to go and do a plating if you recognize it intraoperatively. Now you can see in this, we had a 75 year old females, uh, female patient, very obese, severe virus deformity and they underwent total knee arthroplasty. You can see in this post-operatively, it is recognized that there is a very small stress fracture which is running across the bottom of the tibia, just distal to the keel of the implant. Now this is something which is so undisplaced, you can't see it you know, sometimes even intraoperatively because you may not expose till that particular level. But when you recognize it in the post-operative period and you have these features such as a female patient obese and everybody, you preferably do not try to manage this conservatively as far as possible. Why? Because if you do a fixation, even in these undisplaced fractures which you may miss intraoperatively, you can do early range of movement and mobilization. Otherwise, you're going to give them a brace and then your knee replacement function of uh, stiffness and everything uh, you know, to prevent it is gone because you're going to give them a lot of immobilization. And then there's a disadvantage of doing surgery. It's obviously morbidity of a secondary procedure, but you know, you have to look at risk versus benefit. So in this patient, what did we do? We just simply went ahead and put a longer lateral locking plate on this patient. And she's able to immediately do range of movement. We're able to do partial weight bearing, and then she's able to do full weight bearing by six weeks post-operatively. So this is something you can consider. Now, what would you have done if, if you would have recognized this intraoperatively? So probably you would have put a stem which has gone beyond this stress fracture site or this fracture site. And then you can use probably a relatively shorter plate so that you can bypass. So you have an intramedullary fixation with the stem stability, and then you have an extramedullary or a plate fixation for the same thing. Right? So this is just the same thing, stemmed implants to help transfer the load across the fracture site to an intact diaphysis, and that helps to heal the fracture as well. And when you have this... Uh, uh, a plating option, you can go with it. If you have instability secondary to this sort of a fracture, increased constraint is always recommended. Metaphyseal fractures can always be managed on the tibial side with augments or screw fixation. And in very severe fractures or a poor bone quality, you can even consider using the sleeves, uh, sleeves for getting uh, better fixation. Intraoperative fractures of patella, to be honest, we have I don't think we have encountered even one case uh, at our institute, at least I have not in the time that I've been here. So uh, probably if it is a very obvious transverse fracture, then you will have to again deal with it and just do a fixation with K wires and tension band wearing as we normally do. Uh, if it is like a lower pole fracture where it is not disrupting your extensor mechanism, then you will probably do fragment excision and ensure that your patellar tendon is intact. And talking about patellar tendon, this is one of the dreaded complications because it's even MCL you can repair. You can, you have a muzzle tear, you can repair a muzzle tear. You have a quadriceps tendon issue, you can repair it. But an intraoperative patellar tendon rupture or a tear because of your saw blade, especially when you put your tibial jig and you cut, is something that repair is just not going to give you great outcomes. It's a, it's a complication that can cause major issues. So luckily, again, incidence is pretty low. And its incidence is much higher in revision knees and complex deformities, right? And it's the reporting has been less, but it's perceived to be much higher than what literature is saying. And if this rupture or this damage occurs intraoperatively, the total knee components like the patellar button, cement, everything should be implanted. Everything should be done. And then you address your patellar tendon right at the end of the procedure as you standardly do with, uh, you know, ligamentous or these sort of injuries. So usually it's because of secondary to a difficult exposure. They have been, especially in rheumatoid cases, there have been scenarios where you try to dislocate the knee and you put a homan on the lateral side also and you pull and then you suddenly hear a cracking sound and you'll find it's not your NCL, but it's your tibial tuberosity, which is avulsing of the front of the tibia, which is a very dangerous complication. Patients with patella baha or altered patellofemoral dynamics from before surgery are again at a greater risk because that tissue in a patellar baha case is also very short and it's very easy to strip it off or to cause damage to it. So this is your management uh, algorithm when it comes to patellar tendon injuries. 
this is again something which is very specialized unless you do a few cases or assist a few cases it's not easy to do it so always use your seniors help for managing this scenario so if you have an intraoperative thing especially like a saw cut injury to the uh, you know tendon like when you're taking your lateral uh, cut on your tibia you can do a direct repair of the tendon obviously with sutures and always try to augment it if it is avulsing from the tibial tuberosity in the soft tissue is avulsing put drill holes and put suture anchors to hold the whole patellar tendon down onto the uh, tibial tuberosity if you feel that the tissue is really frayed and really thin and poor tissue quality then you have to take some quick decisions one thing is you can use hamstring autografts and then you can tunnel it through the patella and bring it back down and tunnel it through the tibia again i'm not showing you photographs or any video of it because we don't we didn't do it personally and uh, you know this is a pretty specialized thing which again uh, is always preferable to include your arthroplastic arthroscopy consultants in no fresh frozen and freeze dry achilles bone stock etc it's not going to be available everywhere so hamstring autograft is an intraoperative option that you have and if you have it it is always described synthetic marlex mesh or a mesh repair of the patellar tendon has been described with good outcomes so this is something that probably you can all read up about online if i i'll uh, find an uh, article pertaining to it i'll post it on the group so this is how they've done it you can see how they've used even uh, uh, cerclage wires around it because this is these are the wires which are going through the tibial tuberosity and around the patellar uh, or tibial tuberosity and patellar tendon to really hold it down in place because a lot of force goes through this particular point. And on the right, you can see the suture anchor method where they have put suture anchors on two sides and they have run the stitch through the patella, uh, sorry, through the patellar tendon onto the patella and then it is tightened with suture anchors which gives a lot of stability. So this is one of our cases. We had a case where we had bilateral OA, patient underwent bilateral total knee arthroplasty and you know 10 weeks later she landed up with the infection on one side with a discharging sinus exactly from that area of the tibial tuberosity, which is a very common location for a sinus to develop, right? So we've gone for a stage one procedure. Like we said, when you do repeated procedures, patellar tendon, tibia, the whole resection, depth, everything changes, keeps changing and your bone quality really comes down. You don't have much bone stock. So finally, when you get this clinical picture and we open, you have a very stiff knee, multiple surgeries, and this patient with a frail uh, patellar tendon and a tubular tuberosity, you have a avulsion of the patellar tendon itself, not the bone. This has come off from the tibial tuberosity, right? You can see it on the left side. So what did we do? We did the implantation. We went ahead with the procedure. Don't stop your procedure and keep prolonging your time. Go ahead with what you need to do. In fact, this will probably give you better exposure for the case. It's like doing a tibial tubercle osteotomy. So finish your procedure, come back, run a cracko sort of a stitch, uh, through the whole tendon and this is what we did so you can see how it's being pulled from the bottom and then it is being stabilized over there and then we have put suture anchors into that position and then the arthrotomy is preferably closed in extension protect it for one to two weeks and then you can start gradual range of movement without any excessive uh, thing so obviously in this case since it was a revision procedure soft tissue will be a big problem on the anterior side and the wound can't be approximated over the patellar tendon so we had to do a medial rotation flap fasciocutaneous flap around the patellar tendon area to keep it closed and that also aids in the healing of whatever repair you have done so immediately post-op this is how it looks you can see the suture anchor uh, on the anterior part in the lateral uh, view of the x-ray and that gives you the confidence that the soft tissue and the tibial tuberosity are well maintained so 10 months uh, follow-up when she's coming you can see she's having active extension of the knee without any issue and then the uh, sinus and everything also settled down over a period of time so thank you this was about the uh, complications that you can encounter intraoperatively so probably we can take some questions at the end we can take any questions right now perhaps yeah yes. if you have any we questions can we can take questions. now yeah yeah we can take a few questions now It was very clear for answers, so no doubts. <laughs> I think, I think it's very important. Again, I think uh, what people should understand is that, yes, arthroplasty itself is specialized, 
but a lot of the complications that you deal with intraoperatively are all trauma related, right? So that exposure to trauma, the exposure to plating tube, which gives you that versatility, which is very important. I'm sure that is why a lot of our senior surgeons also say you have to go through the trauma training because if you land up with the problem intraoperatively and nobody's there. You to, have to manage. You, you can manage it directly. You will be able to do it. So that is why our seniors always tell us, you know, get exposed to trauma. You can plate your own femur. You can put screw fixation. You can plate your tibia. And then you don't have to really get confused about what to do. Always involve your trauma uh, team when they're available for you. They are doing it on a daily basis. So it's always good. So it's it's all about being prepared. Most of these complications are not immediately threatening. I think the thing which obviously it's very easy for us to say, you will panic at that moment, but the more calm you are and then you manage it with this algorithmic approach, you will you will get good outcomes without fail. One very interesting Sir. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, have you come across with cement induced uh, pulmonary embolism? I mean to say that uh, any kind of uh, uh, cement uh, embolization may be felt during the intraoperative period. So I think that is a complication which we have not seen as, as far as total knee replacement is concerned. I think it's more of a concern with uh, femur instrumentation yes. which you have with uh, hip surgeries because of the depth to which you go and the cement goes that far to cause an embolus. In, in, the, in the case of uh, TKR, it's a very, you're, you're only dealing with the surface of the bone. Even if you stem a component, you're not going to use such a long stem that is going to push fat in. Even then, if you want to, you know, generally prevent this embolus sort of a thing intraoperatively, when you do your intramedullary uh, uh, drilling to put your really? for the femur cut immediately suction that area off to remove any uh, fat or anything usually cement will not cause an issue in total knee okay can um, cement uh, can cement uh, temperature can cause any nerve injury usually very unlikely again because it's very much cementing in in uh, tkr is very much direct under vision so it is very unlikely that it will extrude beyond your bone margins to go impinge on any nerve unless you leave it in the posterior bit. But again, the nerve is pretty far away. So for you to do that, a large amount of cement has to really go posterior without you knowing, which is very unlikely again, because your tibia is subluxated already when you're doing cementing. Sir, in mid-substance MCL tear, which sutures you use for direct repair? For as far as uh, our institute is concerned, we are using Ethibond, uh, you know, number five on a regular basis. Uh, nowadays, there is another slightly uh, bigger shift towards using something like a fiber wire because probably it is having less amount of soft tissue reaction around it and it gives a much greater amount of tensile strength. So you can use either fiber wire or you can use Ethibond. Do you also expose a little more MCL exposure is also required for the repair? If you are getting a mid-substance tear, usually at the level of your bone cuts, that is, uh, you know, at the level of your meniscus or at the level of your tibia, femur, poster femur, you don't need to expose further below because you know that you have caused injury at that point. You only need to expose further down on your tibia if you are suspecting that, you know, either you have done a big release in a, in a gross deformity and you've gone further down the joint because the insertion is at six centimeters from the tibial levels, right? Six centimeters. So very unlikely that you will level it off from that position unless you have really done a big release. In such case, yes, you can expose and see where you're going and then you can probably repair from there. In routine mid-substance at the level of your cuts, you don't need to expose anything. Thank you. Yeah. What about the tibia periprostate fracture? What precautions do we need to take while cementing or putting a long stem so that it doesn't impinge uh, in the fracture site? The cement. Yeah, I think in, in this case, even if a little cement goes across it, like we said, uh, the uh, plate, if you use it, it gives the stability that it requires to do it. As far as uh, the cement going in is concerned, you just take the precaution that you don't cement the entire stem. You can cement the proximal portion of the uh, tibial component and the keel area and leave the rest of the stem as an uncemented thing. And then you just ensure that you get adequate diameter. The reason why people keep saying you have to cement the entire stem when you put it in is because you need to have cement around it to give full stability. The stem serves no purpose if it is undersized. So cement, uh, you know, it negates that factor. But in this case, you can leave that area uncemented and remove the cement at the level of the keel when you are putting it in so that cement doesn't get carried all the way down. That's the only precaution that you can take. Thank you, sir. 
perhaps uh, about this uh, constraint implants uh, and they're using MCL injury. Uh, can you just elaborate about this hinge uh, and where as well this constraint injury then? Right. So essentially what you need to know is hinge is an extreme option, right? So you're operating on a 50, 60 year old for a primary knee and you get an intraoperative MCL injury. Uh, if you use a hinge, there are some benefits that is stability, but there are a lot of trade-offs that, you know, about longevity of the implant. So usually when you upsize your polyethylene insert, it takes care of most of the instability that you're getting from a mid substance tear or anything, because you're also addressing the repair, right? Let's say you have an avulsion, you're fixing it. If you have a mid substance tear, you're imbricating it with your sutures. So you regain some tension there. So hinge is not your primary option. When you use a valgus virus constraint implant, like a CCK knee, it gives you very good stability in your extension because it has a much bigger tibial post engaging with a bigger tibial, sorry, femoral box. So your extension is taken care of by the implant. The thing that CCK implant doesn't take care of is your flexion instability. And that is where the repair of your uh, ligament with these sutures is very important in mid flexion and at 90 degrees of flexion. So you can use CCK implants to give you extension stability and you further augment the MCL with your repair to give you flexion stability. If you feel it's a big opening and even, you know, large size like 17 and all mm is not giving you your stability uh, with an increased poly size, then probably you will have to take a, a decision on table to go for a hinge. Usually rare, but it's, it's the right way to do. You cannot compromise on it. Thank you, sir. Do you come across I mean, patella tendon necrosis in infective cases? I wouldn't say necrosis, but we definitely come across sinuses which go in that area and really cause disruption of it. Yeah. It's a relatively avascular structure, right? So it's more of a local destruction caused by the infection than anything else. Sir, in your institution, do you routinely do patella resurfacing? No, we do not replace the patella. We only perform patellar debulking with the saw where we remove all the peripheral osteophytes with a, uh, with a bone nibbler or a ronger and we uh, flatten the surface of the patella, make it like a dome shape using the saw. We do not replace, we have not replaced in the last 10 years. So, uh, just a request to all teacher. Uh, if it is possible, uh, just for the completion sake, can we have a video on a patella resurfacing? There is a video on this one, which will be presented. Okay, thank you. If no more questions, we can proceed to the second talk. Yeah. Sir, what... Uh... Go ahead. Yeah, please go ahead. So, what are the minimum thickness of patella uh, to required to replace it? The minimum is two centimeters. I think just little more, little it's less. It's like fourteen millimeter. Yeah. If your patella thickness after your uh, the uh, patella cut is less than twelve millimeters, then you it is a contraindication. So the patellar buttons are of two uh, sizes. One is six millimeter, other is eight millimeter, and there are two types: polyethylene based or a metal based. So the minimum amount of the thickness you need to have is the fourteen millimeter of the bone. Okay, sir. And that is for the uh, fourteen millimeters is also after you uh, take, after you cut it. So. Cut it. If you start, if you take it from the start, usually a rule of thumb that we usually say is your patella should be at least around 18 to 20. So almost like two centimeters yeah. thick across, because like Dr. Ratnakar said, when, especially when you're using a metal backed sort of a patella, your cut across the patella is pretty sizable. It will knock off at least three, four mm of bone. So after you take that cut, uh, 12 to 14 mm is the limit. Yeah. So again, it is generally said for females, it is 18 to 20 and males, it is 20 to 22. Right. Okay, thank you. Sir, how much is the no. stand size for tibia advisable minimum from the uh, fracture side? Like how long it should be from the fracture side? Uh, can you just repeat your question? Uh, how long should be the stem size from the tibia, periprostatic fracture tibia? How long should be the prostate, uh, stem size 
from the feature side is there any minimum length required that yeah, at least it should cross at 4 least to 5 4 cm from the four axis side minimum minimum 4 cm 4 cm thank you twice the canal diameter is this right yeah Uh, uh, what is the post op uh, mobilization in case of patella tendon rupture after uh, augmenting with a uh, so after usually, augmentation yeah so if you augment it like with suture anchors and you are you are very sure about the continuity of the patella tendon the ideal way is to uh, immobilize in extension for at least uh, one to one 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 and a half weeks and then after that you will start range of movement so you will gradually go i think the best sort of a regimen would be uh, first one week no movement and after that you can do uh, 20 to 30 degrees every week till they regain movement something similar to what you do what you would do with your uh, mcl reconstructions also you will do a 30 degree increment every week uh, to regain range of movement thank you so ju ju just for a clarification will we have any sessions on um, usage of the tibial stem and the femoral stem how to uh, what are the sizes when to use it how to um, use it in the cases i have one single slide on the stem uses uh, just during a presentation for management of bone defects especially sir how to use a offset stem in tibia side it's very difficult to get video of usually all these offset stems and all are uh, part of your revision scenario or a very complex scenarios uh, for straight forward primary is very rarely will require any offset stems and every system has got an instrumentation so once you do your intramedullary uh, instrumentation there will be something called as a dialer which will just take its own offset based on the reading you just adjust your offset on that one so every system has got different uh, of uh, instrumentation for that one we don't have any videos for that one only smith and nephew jimma they have offset stems they have dialing and striker and has got three under striker Ridvi has asked one very interesting question that if you have done plating in preprosthetic scenario intraoperatively how do you explain it to the patient and attendants you have to be honest with them you you know you you obviously got it because of something some pre existing thing like either osteoporosis bone is porotic or something you can tell yeah correct like madam said if bone is porotic and everything you explain to the patient that this is it during during surgery during instrumentation this fracture has occurred because of the bone quality being like that these are the precautions that we have taken this is going to help her mobilize in this way and what treatment you are going to give to ensure that the bone heals we have to be open basically why did it happen what did you do and how is it going to affect the patient these three things you have to be very clear in your communication to the patient after surgery if you explain properly they don't misunderstand usually they can understand your problem Uh, sandeep can we proceed okay sir sir my pointer is visible sir yeah yeah so good evening everyone uh, next uh, topic is post operative x ray assessment last time it was pre operative x ray assessment by me so let us now briefly dis uh, discuss about uh, post -oper post operative x rays myself dr sandeep uh, with a fellowship training in orthoplasty from sunshine hospitals okay so first thing after uh, we would have done a good uh, total knee replacement and will be more anxious how the post operative x rays look and even in my starting days of orthoplasty i was very anxious for the post op x for my first case i think i was not able to sleep also uh, after uh, checking the x ray the next day then only i was able to sleep 
so it is very important for the for in the starting days of your orthoplastic career but after doing some 50 to 60 cases you you just see it and uh, you'll not be much tense out of anything so first important thing don't jump to conclusion after seeing an x-ray that this x-ray is right this x-ray is wrong this surgeon could have done well this surgeon could have done that way this way because we we never know what is the situation during the surgery so first thing is so we need a consistent approach step by step how to read an x-ray and look for imp key important points in these x-rays so when do we take post-op x-ray frequently post-op x-rays are taken on icu beds where you cannot maintain adequate antero posterior and lateral views you cannot assess it because you'll be doing it with a mobile x-ray machine mobile x-ray machine may not have immediately a view box to check whether it, this ap views are right or not lateral views right or not you might have to take multiple times and the more time you take x-rays more tense the patient will be once uh, you're repeating the x-rays explain the patient that nothing is problematic just a small view problem if not you are if you take multiple times patient will be in a feeling that there's something has gone wrong during surgery that's why they're repeating the x-ray they're trying to cover up something so whenever you're repeating x-ray not just explain yourself but also explain patient and uh, Look for key points. One is coronal alignment, sagittal alignment, postal condylar offset and joint line will be going. Uh, so right side, we have an ex example X-ray. So we'll be discussing the same X-ray all throughout for uh, uniformity. So is it a good quality X-ray? By the word, I mean anteroposterior view. Here we can see fibula is 50% overlap. So this, I take it as a good, uh, good X-ray. And here you can see keel is in the center. This is femur component. This is tibia component. The center gap is where you have polyethylene. So during surgery, we'll be more confident like femur is sitting well or not. We'll be seeing directly with our eyes. TBI is sitting well or not. We'll be directly sit seeing with our eyes. But any fractures that will be hidden from us above the femur, below the tibia. So most important, arguably most important reason why we take post-operative x-rays is fractures. So initially, you have to recognize the implant uh, because PFC has one type of design. Uh, BP, buccal purpose has a different type of design. So whenever some post-op x-ray comes to you, first try to identify the implant design, which implant company it is. So is it a primary or revision implant? If you're seeing just a femur and tibia, definitely it is primary. If you're seeing a long post in between it, it could be a constrained implant. And if you are seeing a communication between the femur and tibia, which large metal between these both, maybe it is a hinge implant. In that way, you might you, you should be able to identify. So coming to, let us stick to basics of primary TKR and not going to revisions or something. So first, tibial component. Is there any overhang? Here you can see in the orange uh, color. Here tibia is flush with the uh, cortex because in this proximal tibia, peripheral rim is cortical area and centrally it is a very smooth area. So your tibia, when it is sitting on a peripheral thick cortical region, stability is more. Whenever you're, if you're downsizing your, if your tibial component is very small when compared to tibial size, it may sink because the center part is very porotic. So overhang and then and the next and for example, if there is a small overhang over the tibia, don't jump that array, there is an overhang surgeon has done wrong. No, sometimes tibial component could be a size, size of one and uh, the native tibia is lesser than the size of one. So you don't get components less than size one. So the surgeon might have adjusted accepting a lateral overhang because for example, if the tibial component size is very small, you don't accept mere or medial overhang because there'll be MCL. You can accept lateral overhang. So whenever there is lateral overhang, first go back, check for the size of tibia. If it is one, then understand that uh, the, uh, the surgeon has tried for one, but still it, is, it was large. And so he has accepted the lateral overhang. And the next is component alignment. Here in pink line, you can see the mechanical axis. Here, frequently post-operatively, we take only implant or distal femur and proximal tibia covering excess. We don't take this long, le long leg X-rays. So it, frequently it is difficult to assess the mechanical axis. So let us take in view of anatomical axis. Here in blue color, we have anatomical axis. Here you can see implant is almost uh, along the uh, anatomical axis. So acceptable error, error is plus or minus three degrees. So if you're aiming for neutral, as last class Swasar was explaining, if you're aiming for neutral, you will be somewhere between plus three, three degrees varus to three degrees valgus, which is acceptable. But you are thinking of doing a functional alignment with a mechanical, uh, with, with the conventional uh, TKR jigs. You are, if you are trying to achieve three degrees virus, you will be somewhere between zero degrees to six degrees virus, which is not acceptable. 
So here you can see in this X-ray tibial component component is almost well aligned. And now come to femoral component in anteroposterior views. Here we can see blue light blue color is anatomical axis of femur, and uh, thick blue is the mechanical axis of the lower limb. Lower limb. So again, femur is there any orang? Definitely orang is not accepted here. You can see orange color. We have some bone. There is no overhang. And is the joint line recreated? So Sandeep, joint first we need to know what is the calculation. One Sandeep, sir. Can I just interrupt here? So when you want to look in the AP view, the sizing of the TV or the femur, uh, don't just look overhang or underhang because your sizing is never dependent on the medial lateral size. It is based on the anterior posterior dimension for the femur and the anterior posterior dimension for the lateral condyle of the tibia. So just looking at the AP view and telling that it is underhanging or overhanging is a wrong thing to be done. Yeah, exactly. So first we go, we discuss AP and we'll discuss also lateral and the sir has a, raised a valid point. And next thing is in AP, what we can see is joint line is recreated or not. So one centimeter from fibula head, 23. Uh, so joint line is somewhere one centimeter above the uh, fibula head. It is at a distance of 23 mm from the lateral epicondyle and 28 mm from the medial epicondyle. So if we have, cal we need to have calibrated X-rays for that. There we can check whether the joint line is recreated or not. The more, more amount of distal femur cut you take, more amount of joint line elevation, you get it. And more amount of joint line elevation, uh, so many papers have shown more than 5 mm of joint line elevation, post-op uh, results are, are not that great. And uh, there is more chance of mid-flexion instability. And are the medial and lateral gaps equal? See here you can see in a pink color, we have equal medial and lateral gaps. Sometimes whenever you, if you leave your joint tight on medial side, medial side gap will be less and lateral side gap will be more. That should be avoided. And component alignment, again, you put your femur component along the mechanical axis, not the anatomical axis. So whenever you are checking the anatomical axis, it will be somewhere at five degrees. So you check whether what your plan is right or not. And lateral view again, take a, get a good quality lateral view. How to get a good clot, uh, quality lateral view? Your condyle should overlap. And uh, any fractures, lateral side, sometimes you can, uh, in lateral axis, you can find X -ray, uh, fractures which cannot you find on APA view. So in lateral thing, first we, we have to see whether it is, which kind of component it is. Uh, it is a posterior stabilized or cruciating. Here you can see a big box. It is posterior stabilized knee. If you're not, finding a box and you are finding two pegs. It is a cruciate retaining knee. And uh, second one is whether it is cemented or uncemented. In India, most mostly we are using only cemented implants. Here you can see a small amount of cement mantle. Uh, so uncemented implants we are not using right now. So in uncemented implants, there will be no cement mantle. There will be just femur component and there will be screws or pegs, which will be catching uh, the component to the bone. Second, third one is anterior notching is present or not. Here you can see three, there is no notching. In fact, there is a bit air walling of the femur. If your flexion is more, if your component on femur component is more flexed, it will just notch into this anterior cortex and cause notching. We'll see X-rays later. And is the posterior condylar off offset recreated? If you draw a line from this posterior cortex of the femur and draw a line from anterior cortex of the femur, the distance between this, this posterior line and the posterior most part of the condyle is a posterior condylar offset. We have to recreate the offset. So how do you know whether we have recreated it or not? One thing you can compare with the normal normal side or preoperative x-rays or, or if not, we can just calculate the posterior condylar offset, which is a 0 0.44 ratio, Whether then we can know whether it, we, we have recreated or not. And uh, can we go back? Yeah, and uh, whether the femur size is appropriate or not. As uh, Ratnakar has, has rightly pointed out, femur size is appropriately guessed on a lateral X-ray rather than an AP X-ray. So here, your femur, uh, your femur component should not notch the anterior cortex and your PCO should be recreated. So how do you know the PCO is recreated? Here you can see Shenton's line. This posterior cortex will be in, should be in continuation with this. Uh, femur component, then you can say PCO is adequately uh, recreated. So if PCO is recreated and there is no notching, definitely the com femur component is appropriately sized. Sometimes there may be mismatch between anterior posterior and, and uh, medial lateral sizing. Sometimes component may be, may be uh, like small for medial lateral, but it may be adequate for anterior. Anterior posterior is most important. 
and femur flexor action we have did. And uh, is the joint line recreated? Yes, we can check the joint line in lateral X-ray also with the blue man's lats line, but it is difficult in PS knees and all. And here we can guess whether we have to see whether the posterior osteophytes are completely removed because they may cause a mechanical block for the poly, especially in uh, uh, cruciate substituting designs. We have uh, elevated posterior lip, which may impinge on this posterior osteophytes. So we have to remove them adequately. And tibial component ang angle, again, we can see whether there is overhang or not. And whether the cement fixation is fine. We there are seven zones which we can identify over the femur and tibia. So these seven, whether the uh, tibia is cemented ad adequately on all sides. Here we can see uh, cementation is adequate. And is the is the tibia a tibia plus polytype or an all polytype? Whenever you have an all polytype, you'll not be able to see this radio opaque uh, image. I'll show you later. Is the top tibia slope recreated or not? You draw a straight line over the anterior cortex of tibia on the lateral X-ray, uh, lateral X-ray, and also a horizontal line along the tibia. The angle is known as tibial slope. Routinely, in cruciate retaining, we have we take more slope. In posterior stabilis, we take less slope. It is because we are retaining the PCL. And also sometimes we have, for example, if you take buccal papas, we take 10 degrees posterior slope in buccal papas, whereas 3 degrees to 5 degrees slope in PFC and all. So even this slope even varies with implant implant design also. That's why we have to we have to know what is the slope of the native implant design. We have to identify the implant also. So let us uh, briefly check few examples. For example, here we have an X-ray. In the left side, we can see uh, this was taken. Patient was in pain. X-ray was taken with the knee inflexed, and uh, patient was just lying to the lateral side. And this here you can see fibula is not fifty percent overlap. This is not a true AP. This is taken in flexion. And here uh, it looks like uh, implant is in valgus. But uh, whenever uh, the same patient, when uh, if we have taken proper AP view here, you can see it is almost neutrally aligned. So don't comment, uh, don't just uh, jump and comment on X-rays, uh, like uh, which are not true AP views. In lateral view, you can see this is a true lateral view. And whenever you can see a small uh, post here, these are uh, posts. These posts are mostly present for rotating polys, mobile polys. So this is a buccal papas design. With mobile ball. Here you can see there is almost some 10 degree slope which has to be given for buccal papa for better flexion. And this x-ray, you can see this uh, tibia is uh, directed medially and this is not a true AP because fibula is not 50% out. Especially in buccal papas, there is a dv in, B B in PFC and all, the keel is almost in the center. But this is not in the center. This is slightly posterior. So especially in buccal, buccal papa x-rays, don't comment on varus and valgus unless uh, unless you have a true AP view. And here, here you can see one more X-ray. Uh, there is a overhang on lateral side on AP on tibia, and in lateral also there is slight overhang. And going back, this is a smallest. This was a smallest size tibia, and uh, we cannot go smaller than that. That that is the reason the surgeon has accepted a lateral overhang, and he did not accept a medial overhang. And here, sorry for the bad quality. I did not have a, uh, in our series, we do not have notched X-ray. So I had to borrow it from the internet. So here you can, you can see anterior cortex is notched and this is definitely predisposed for fracture. That and this is all poly. That tibia is all poly. Yes, ma'am, this all poly. And uh, here you can see, uh, you, have, you can see extra screws here. These screws, whenever uh, you, you see such screws, you just expect whether did they use it for filling the gap or for anything else? For here, you can see there is there are two screws which are and there is you can see radio opaque thing. This is the cement, so they have tried to fill the cement with, uh, with uh, screws and uh, cement defect with screws and cement. And he, this is a striker triathlon uh, uh, done with the uh, Mecha robot. And here you can see a plate in post-op X-ray. So our expectations is there was a medial condyle uh, fracture or ever uh, fracture. So, which was plated uh, during surgery. And in this x-ray, you can see there are screws, entire implant, femur is sitting well, tibia is sitting well, cementation is adequate, but you can see two screws and without any cement. So, these screws, uh, these screws were used to fix the bone graft to the bone. So, you can see there is no cement around the screw. So, you need to, uh, so this is also a possibility. And post-operatively, just you can find, sometimes you can find x-rays. So you have to be very careful while banging. 
here you can see this still the staples are intact uh, post operatively we have a fracture this had to be managed with plating and these are not immediate post op x-rays so you can see just just for completion sake of this x-rays you can see lysis below the tibia lysis below the tibia this is a case of prostatic joint infection and in severe cases there is a this is a case of aseptic loosening no signs of any infection uh, like here you can see tibia component is upsided femur component whenever you want to look for subsidence and all go for serial x-rays sometimes uh, the surgeon may, might have put the uh, tibia tibia component in 3 degrees or in robotics or something but uh, so check for serious x-rays then you will know whether the tibia is subsiding or not and here uh, this is a all poly x-ray you can see you cannot see any uh, tibia component whenever you are not seeing tibia component it is a all poly thing and initially when i was in the starting days of uh, starting days of post graduation uh, i saw this x-ray somewhere uh, in, in a conference i thought it is a new different kind of tcr implant so this is a cement spacer custom made cement spacer which you can uh, do it with uh, custom made blocks uh, this is done for a, a revision implant was removed and a custom made cement spacer was placed so that a patient gets uh, so this is not a tcr implant this is just a cement spacer so thank you and uh, what, there are two topics which i did not cover one is uh, uh, what one is patella so we also resurface patella we do we don't do it regularly so we resurface patella in patella you have to check whether the patella cut surface is parallel to the tibia or not whether the angulation of the uh, angulation is right or not there are any fractures in the poly and whether patella femoral offset is maintained or not whether there is overstuffing understuffing and all that uh, we are not doing patella resurfacing regularly so that is another topic which i did not cover and uh, that's it thank you we covered all things any Did questions you know? questions are invited sir how much lateral overhang of femoral component is acceptable i mean is there any line or something criteria uh, do not accept any component overhang uh, so frequently you will not get uh, that much overhang max 2 3 mm overhang will be there if it is there accept a lateral overhang rather than medial because lateral structures are present at a, at a distance from uh, bone not uh, attached to the bone so as a rule don't accept any overhang if you have to accept accept lateral lateral overhang not more than 2 mm ratna are you going with uh, bone defects uh thinking ma'am because it's already 920 now uh, already 920 whether all these x rays are weight bearing x rays no 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 post no, no. post operatively post operatively is fine post operatively we see patients post operatively uh, they will be in pain walking will be difficult so it is very difficult to convince the patient to get a weight bearing x ray these are immediate post ops like taken on day one so these are not uh, weight bearing x rays these are all non weight bearing x rays there is no indication for immediate post op weight bearing x ray unless you suspect some uh, medial or lateral laxity or something no you need not take it interpretation of the post op x ray should be done in weight bearing or non weight bearing immediate post op non weight bearing only do it because you cannot do a, take a weight bearing x ray but properly if you want to interpret post op x rays after uh, after like uh, after a month or two months take a weight bearing x ray only suppose if your x ray is not good patient is keeping knee in flexion or in a awkward position if you want to see the x ray go there to the patient and keep knee straight and take x ray no weight bearing x ray immediate post operative and uh, nikhil how does questions it... nikhil uh, that how do you interpret the space like medial space more than the lateral space or lateral space more than the medial space uh, So don't worry about one to two millimeter of uh, issues because nowadays people say that some amount of laxity of one to two mm in extension is easily should be acceptable. So if your medial space is uh, very much different from the lateral space, then only you should understand that it is too much tightness on the medial side. For one to two millimeter, there is nothing to be worried. And again, like uh, we said, most of these X-rays are non-weight bearing X-rays. so 
uh, sometimes in a very obese ladies where the thighs are rubbing against each other, although you might have got a very good alignment on table, but post-operative x-rays are showing some amount of the medial tightness. So just by seeing the x-rays, you need not be worried at all. As long as you retrospectively think about intraoperative stability, ROM, uh, if everything is good, then don't worry about those things. Congruency, stability, if everything is good, one to two millimeters later, like it is no problem. Yeah. And what Sandeep was telling about the difference in the medial and the lateral swazer, it is too much different. For example, if you think that there is some MCL injury or there is some collateral injury, then almost the spacers will be doubled. You should be worried of only such things, not about one to two millimeters. Usually, uh, surgeons, they don't close it uh, if they have abnormal gaps. Yes. In extension, lateral laxity of 2 mm is acceptable. In flexion, a lateral laxity of 4 mm is acceptable. And uh, most important... I, 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 and again, again, all these things are for the people who do functional alignment, not for the mechanical alignment. Not for mechanical okay. alignment. <laughs> So one How to see the your femoral component is in flexion? Yeah. So you, you get you more draw space. A line along space. the shaft of the femur in the lateral view, and you draw one more line along the flange of the femur. So whatever is the angle that is formed in between the two lines, that is the shaft and the flange, that is the amount of the flexion in the femoral component. And second thing, whenever you have a pex in the femoral component these specs will direct towards the posterior cortex of the femur. Suppose if there is angulation between the pecs and the posterior cortical line, then again it indicates that there is some flexion in the femoral component. Got it? Yes. If it's notching, this means it's an extension. Yeah. Not yeah. Now Let's again for the notching, there is something called grading. There are four grades of notch. We should be worried about only the fourth grade of notch. Sometimes the first no, grade no, and the no, second no, grade, no, nothing is, much to worry. No, no, no. His question is, if there is notching, uh, the component is in extension. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That, that, that yeah, I said. Yeah. yeah, that may be true. And one more thing, your flexion and extension is not uh, weak. See, in, earlier, we used to do navigation. In navigation, we used to check this flexion and extension based on the anatomical axis of the femur on lateral X-ray. So whenever you are checking to anatomical axis, you have to keep the femur component three degrees flexion. You should not align along the anatomical axis. You need to align the femur component along the mechanical axis. So that is the reason in all femur components, there will be three degrees flexion. And uh, most important takeaway point I want to tell is, if you want to repeat a post-operative x-ray, explain the patient. So it is where uh, patient just goes everywhere. They think uh, something has gone wrong. Already they'll be having pain. Uh, they wait for one day, they'll still they'll be having pain. They think uh, Are babre, uh, this, something should have happened, pain is not coming down, they have cut something. So just explain patients before repeating the excess. That is only one good, only one thing. If not, intraoperatively, we will be checking the femur on all sides. It will be good. On TBA, we will be checking alignment also. You have uh, nowadays good alignment, jigs and all. Mostly will not go wrong if you are uh, if you are using your jigs right. So that is. Okay. What, is so post in, what is small post, post in tibia for that uh, you said over rotating polys? So that is for the, that is a post uh, on which the uh, polyethylene will have a slot there. So this polyethylene slot will rotate on that small post and give the mo uh, mobile bearing uh, this one. So here you can see in this uh, uh, lateral view, uh, Please check this lateral view. You can have a small post. This is stop button for rotation. So you cannot, poly cannot just rotate 360 degrees over tibia. There is some stop, which is a 45 degrees rotation, which is possible. This is the stop button. And here you can see two metal things, two metal pointers. They will point uh, to what is the rotation of poly. So one, sometimes if you have a spin out, you can see this line will be somewhere here, somewhere. So to check for spin out also, that is helpful. It is not, uh, it is very, very bucal purpose only. Yeah, mobile bearing. See, there are also mobile, mobile bearings in uh, revision TKRs in DEPU also. Mobile bearing implants are there. Primaries, yeah, take it as bucal papa.
sir. Uh, so I can to... share you the video for that one. Just give me a video. Right. Please share. Uh, uh, sir, can yes, just, sir. Uh... yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll stop sharing. Yes. One second, sorry. No audio, sir. Uh, sir, you are on mute. Uh, you can see that uh, video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we, so can that is a post. we cannot. We cannot hear your voice. The post no, you are seeing there is so that is a see. slot which is given on the back side of the polyethylene that is articulating with that post on the TBL component. So that is a mobile bearing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that is a stopper which gives a total arc of 45 degrees, 15 degrees on either side. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Please share video on posterior capsule release and uh, showing uh, no residual flexion deformity with trial poly articulation. You we requested last. Last time it was uh, showed, right? It was shown. Right? It was shown. No. You have video yeah. one video. Yeah, I had shown the posterior capsular release last time only. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stiffly. Yeah, still I'll 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 share, I'll share that video to you. You send that in the group. Yes, ma'am. When you were explaining the uh, FFD, you showed that picture. How that to release the posterior capsule? Yes, ma'am. You send that video. Any more question, guys? Okay, thank you. Sir, uh, yeah. sir. Uh, sir, after two, three months of the uh, TKR operation, if any patient uh, fell down or having some injury to the knee and we suspect some MCL tear or LCL tear uh, and what is the grade of that tear, can you go advise uh, the patient for go for the MRI? Uh, is it possible? Uh, Just get the stress view, no? Stress x-rays, you get it. That will be enough, no? Uh, sir, in the X-ray, there is no fractures and in stress fracture, there is medial gapping is there. Even if uh, yeah, that is what if you mm. give the stress, you value the stress and see how much is the medial opening. If it is a significant yeah. medial opening, it is clear that you have a mid substance MCL tear because yeah. if at all it is an avulsion injury that will be seen on an X-ray. So if there are no fractures, and there is a significant medial opening. It's an MCL mid substance tear. What more you want on an MR? No need for MRA. Because even if you get an MRA scan, uh -huh. uh, you will have a lot of artifacts. You may not yes. be able to access the things. 
the right. clear picture of uh, medial collateral will not be seen with the implant. Usually, such things, mid-substance medial collateral will not happen afterwards. Mm -hmm. Suppose mm -hmm. if they have uh, gross injuries, mm -hmm. then you have to open and uh, redo the procedure and uh, go with the constraint. Mm -hmm. Sir, on seeing the X-rays, how can we decide which company implant is used? Yes, you have to yes. identify the implants. Which can you please elaborate that them. thing? Which company we are using in the X-rays? Mother, four or five companies. If you can explain, please. Yeah, we will share you. Yeah, I we think one of our fellows, actually. please share those uh, PPT to me. I'll share to them. Now, Sandeep has shown that Smith & Nephew X-ray and Bukel Prapas X-ray, and we'll show some of the X-rays. At least some companies, at least five, six companies, you have to identify the X-rays. Actually, in, in Chiranji Madam's last talk, there were all implant X-rays. Uh, I showed all X-rays. Uh, if you go through Chiranji Madam's talk, uh, there will be all implant x-rays and the method of identifying it. But uh, we'll also share the PDF file, how to identify what are the landmarks in the group. Okay, sir. Okay, guys. If everything is done, so we I'll I have shared the PDF file in the group. Despite that, if you have any doubts, we'll be happy to.
सर इज द मीटिंग ओवर सर आर वी हैविंग मोर लेक्चर्स और इज इट ओवर I think uh, why all are left and they told for the TBL defect lecture is still pending. I don't know. Is anyone is there? 